Her Excellency, the Emperor Luizzi, Governor General Emerita, Honorable Sean Edwards, Minister of Education, Sustainable Development, Innovation, Science, Technology, and Vocational Training. Ago, Secretary General, Organization of American States. Her Excellency, Justin Henry Martin, Ambassador and Coordinator, Coordinating Office of the Offices and Units of the General Secretariat in Member States. His Excellency Luis Manuel Lopez Moreno, Ambassador Designate, Embassy of the United Mexican States. Councillor Umbut Costo, Deputy Head of Mission, Embassy of Brazil. Ms. Lili Ching Soto, Representative, General Secretariat of the Organization of American States in St. Lucia. Representatives and former representatives, Organization of American States. Other members of the Diplomatic Corps, Mr. Clito Springer, Chair of the Board of Governors of the South Louis Community College and other board members. Dr. Keith Nurse, Principal of the South Louis Community College, our presenter. Dr. Mool Thankler Ogis, Vice Principal of the South Louis Community College. Dr. Yannick Yum, Acting Head of the Department of Cultural Studies, Faculty of Culture, Creative and Performing Arts, University of the West Indies, Kayville Campus. Our comment commentator, heads and representatives of the Alumni Association of Tertiary Educational Institutions on the Mon, A Team, the Cultural Development Foundation, the St. Lucia Carnival Bands Association, the Folk Research Center, the St. Lucia National Reparations Committee, the Inter American Institute for Cooperation and Agriculture, managers, academic heads, faculty and staff of the South Lewis Community College students of the South Lewis Community College, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, our online audience. I'd like to welcome you to this auspicious occasion. The resilience of the diaspora. The history of the Americas is one dominated by trauma. From the period of contact through the colonial period, the societies created were formed in the crucible which resulted in much trauma. The nature of the trauma, nature of trauma, sorry, is that victims spend a great deal of time trying to recover from that trauma. But this process often requires a certain amount of forgetting. In the Anglophone Caribbean, where the forces of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade were significant forces in the creation of these societies, much emphasis has been placed on forgetting. What is often ignored is the resilience of the inheritors of these traumas and their success in creating culture and festivals which reinforce and celebrates this. Transatlantic slave trade and slavery created a, dias a diasporic space of the Americas. The people of these societies forged in this, the people, sorry, and societies forged in this space with their self-liberation ethos and self-resilience have resisted and continued to be resilient and in the process created movements festivals, and distinct identities. Our presenter today is uniquely positioned to explore this resilience and resistance, which did not only furnish us with unique identities, but also opportunities for future development. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to this occasion, and I hope that the discourse here will leave us with much food for thought. As we celebrate the fifth annual Inter-American Week for people of African descent in the Americas. At this point, I would like to introduce remarks by Mr. Lewis Ago. Mr. Lewis, uh, try this again. Mr. Lewis Almagro, Secretary General of the Organization of American States. In this year's Inter-American Week for People of African Descent in the Americas, we explore the theme of the stories of courage in the Americas with a focus on resistance to slavery and unity against racism. Today's lecture by a distinguished intellectual and educator from the region offers an intriguing look 
at how the arts and festivals have played a critical role in shaping the discourses and perspectives on the experience of people of the Americas in confronting and resisting physical and psychic oppression. In so doing, the carnivals give voice to the marginalized, from the native indigenous populations to the transplanted Asians and Africans, as well as other migrants from the old world that have come to populate the Americas. Carnivals have grown in stature and importance as expressions of popular culture from the colonial era of plantations and latifundios to the contemporary post-colonial urban spaces in Amaguana, Ecuador, Barranquilla, Colombia, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Porto France, AT, Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago, Castries, Saint Lucia, Fort de France, Martinica, and New Orleans in the USA. These expressions of cultural resistance and creative ingenuity have become key economic drivers, even as they are contested space. These carnivals have also migrated with diaspora populations to global cities in the North Atlantic. The diaspora, Caribbean carnivals of Labor Day in New York, Caribana in Toronto and Notting Hill in London, are among the largest public festivals in their respective spaces. Our featured speaker references the concept of the Black Atlantic as a transnational social formation which carries with its imprimatur of the Americas. In the contemporary age of globalization, this is a signature contribution to intangible cultural heritage and global humanity as we seek to repair the legacies of slavery and combat the evils of racism. I'd like to invite Ms. Tracy George to introduce our speaker. Good afternoon. Dr. Keith Nurse is the principal of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College in St. Lucia. He has worked as senior economist and advisor on structural policies and innovation at the OECD Development Center in Paris. He is the former WTO chair at the University of the West Indies, where he also served as the director of the Sheridath Ramphal Trade Policy Center and as the executive director of UWI Consulting, Inc. He serves on the executive bureau of the UN Committee for Development Policy, a subsidiary body of the United Nations Economic and Social Council. He has served as a member of the Hemispheric Program Advisory Committee of the Inter-American State for Cooperation in Agriculture. He is a former member of the Economic Development Advisory Board, Government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Nurse has worked as a researcher and consultant to governments and international and regional organizations around the world and has published over 100 scholarly papers and articles on a wide array of issue areas such as trade policy and services, industrial policy and innovation governance, creative industries and digital economy, tourism and cultural heritage, migration and diasporas, gender and economic restructuring, climate action and sustainable development. He is also the executive producer of the docudrama Forward Home, The Power of the Caribbean Diaspora. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to Dr. Keith Noose. Thank you very much, Ms. George. Um, welcome all. Uh, all protocols having been observed, um, I'm very gratified that we were able to attract a significant audience here at the college to experience a live presentation. Uh, I must admit I'm a bit rusty. I haven't done this for quite a while. Uh, it, it's two years plus since I've done a live presentation. So please bear with me. I'm hoping that uh, I'm able to share with you some key ideas on the issue of carnivals and the ways in which festivals have impacted upon not just Latin America and the Caribbean, but also our diaspora communities 
in North America and Europe and elsewhere. Often I'm asked, why is it that an international relationist like myself is writing and studying issues like festivals? It's not normal in my field. And in fact, I recall from my younger professional days when my colleagues would look at me with much of a question mark. Um, why are you doing this research? And I would answer that nothing has put the Caribbean on the world map more than our arts. Survey after survey of people who know anything about the Caribbean, when you ask, what do you know about the Caribbean? The answer, Bob Marley, reggae, carnival, and the list goes on. Well, these days it would be Rihanna um, and a whole range of other um, popular culture artists. Um, so that's what puts the Caribbean on the world map. It's also that if you look at how our economies have evolved in the last several decades, the cultural and creative industries have become more prominent. They account for a larger share of GDP, and they also account for an increasing share of our exports and our area, the areas of intellectual property um, accumulation. And so my retort has been that this is a critical area where the Caribbean not only has some prominence worldwide, it's also a mechanism by which we can reinvent ourselves as well as diversify our economies. And these are critical elements of charting a new way forward, um, moving from the challenges of slavery and racism to, in effect, achieve not just resistance, but also resilience. And so I have long argued, and I have written extensively on these matters. In fact, um, one of my most famous articles is on the globalization of Trinidad Carnival. It's been reproduced in multiple texts. Uh, it's been translated into several languages, French, I think even Korean. Um, so it has gone far and wide. I've also written extensively about the creative industries and the ways in which the Caribbean punches above its weight category in terms of this process of generation. But it is really in particular territories all around the region. It's the carnival that has been the bedrock of these cultural and creative industries. It's the source bed. It's the mechanism by which we generate new perspectives on our various art forms. You may well know that I'm a national of Trinidad and Tobago, and Trinidad and Tobago um, claims to have the mother of all carnivals. Um, to be more accurate, what Trinidad can claim to have done through its carnival is generate one of the top two, if not three, most popular national festivals in the world. What do I mean by that? I mean by that that it is the festival that has the highest level of national participation, meaning not just the people who are in the carnival costumes and the bands and in the music trucks and so on, but also the people who are watching on television or participating in any other way. Trinidad and Tobago can also claim to have had the most globalized carnival and particularly festival in the world. This is something that I've documented, as I indicated, through my article on the globalization of Trinidad Carnival. Um, there are in excess of 100 carnivals that draw on the Trinidad and Tobago model and replicate it in, in many respects. And so, uh, it is no surprise then that as a Trinidad and Tobagonian, that carnival has become one of my areas of scholarship. Hmm? Um, it's embedded in my blood. I, I played carnival and masqueraded for, I think, 15 years straight. Um, and the last time I had the opportunity to do so, I think, was in 2017 or 2018. Um, and COVID has interrupted um, this in so many respects. So one of the reasons why I was also intrigued when I was asked by the OAS representative to do something in relation to the theme 
of dealing with the issues of, of racism and slavery uh, and their legacies was to tap into this area. One, because it's very topical, everybody's concerned, how are we going to get back to Carnival? In fact, often when there's a major crisis, that's the first thing that people ask, especially in my homeland. So I felt it was topical to talk about carnivals and festivals because they've been impacted by the issues of mobility in relation to the pandemic. And so public health measures have intervened. What I hope to do today is to take you through a journey um, to illustrate how carnivals and festivals are impactful in terms of generating a new sense of being here in the Caribbean and the wider Americas. So the first thing I wanted to do was highlight the issue of the Black Atlantic. I'm borrowing from Paul Gilroy's notion of a Black Atlantic, which offers a counter-narrative to the ways in which modernity has been largely prescribed and received in the academy. By and large, our notions of modernity are largely scripted within a Western narrative. And it's interesting because in the last few weeks, I've been writing an article for Elgar um, Publishing. They're doing an encyclopedia on development, and they've asked me to write a chapter on culture and development. And so I've read all the literature on culture and development. And what's so striking about it is that even to this day, um, the predominant literature refers largely to the European narrative. It is privileged and it's, all, and it's very hegemonic. And what do I mean by that? What I mean then is that uh, often, and, and it still is the case, uh, we talk about British industrialization and the industrial revolution without making reference to the ways in which, for example, India was deindustrialized through the same process as England was industrialized. And it's evident in the data, and I know it very well. So in 1815, uh, India moved from being a net exporter of textiles and clothing to become a net importer. That same year, Britain became a net exporter of textiles. They taxed the Indian textile industry to become an import sector. Hmm? But you will never hear that in the predominant literature. Nor would you hear about how the Americas were involved in the process. Because if it is cotton that was being the source material for a lot of these textile production, well, cotton doesn't grow in the UK. It grows in the Americas. And so the slave labor that was used to produce the cotton to supply the industry is never referenced when people are talking about the Industrial Revolution in the UK. So it's really important for us to redress this imbalance in the literature and the ways in which our young people learn about the world. So if you do a degree in economics and you are faithful to the literature, um, you are not going to get the full story you are going to get a partial version of the story, which is a very Eurocentric one. So, one of the noted artistic producers in Carnival Rem in Sri Lanka, Tobago and in the Caribbean is Peter Minchel. Uh, I've played several times with his band. And he argues that Carnival is not an art form. It is bigger than that. It is a festival of the arts. Because carnivals operate in the public space, they have a particular dimension to them. They generate uh, a lot of interest in terms of participation, but it also generates a lot of discussion, if not discourses, about the issues that are being reflected in the art forms. So carnivals are associated with social protest. So many of the songs, whether it's Cumbia or Calypso, 
are protest songs that comment on the conditions in the society as well as some of the solutions. So, recently I've been reading Eric Hobsbawm last book. Um, he died uh, in 2012 and a friend actually gifted me this book and it's interesting um, when you read his book he's talking about fractured times um, and he was really alerting us to what has been evolving in the last uh, decade or so which is that the world is shifting increasingly towards an illiberal order away from a liberal order which we've been enjoying for about a hundred years or so so in effect the pendulum is swinging back to where issues of racism as well as sexism are becoming more to the fore this is not unusual generally when you have an economic crisis or economic in a global economy you see the rise of fascism you see the rise of um, strong racist discourses um, you see the emergence of white ideologies and the list goes on and on so in the literature often people talk about how this new wave reflects a process of deglobalization I want to suggest otherwise this is all part of globalization and one of the critical elements of this process is the ways in which people are pursuing their national identities and in fact making them global in, in the literature there's a lot of talk about what we call festivalization. So, in one of the chapters in Eric Hobsbawm's book, Fractured Times, he raises the question, why hold festivals in the 21st century? Should not be confused with the question, have festivals of future in the 21st century, he argues. He says they obviously have a critical role to play. Festivals are multiplying like rabbits, he argues. Their numbers have been soaring since the 1970s, and nothing suggests that this growth has come to an end. In fact, when I looked at the data, um, the number of festivals have been multiplying exponentially in this period. Governments and cities are using festivals to brand their destinations, but it's also that local groups are utilizing festivals to generate their voice. Hobsbawm then goes on to make an argument. He says, for enjoyment of the arts is not a purely private experience, but a social one, sometimes even a political one, especially in the case of planned public performances. In this regard, I think he is quite correct. So I, I come back to the idea of the Black Atlantic and why had, have I chosen this? Well, in many respects, it explores the theme of hybridity which was generated by the creation of global capitalism and the transatlantic slave trade and so on. But it is also that this process of diasporization has had a second wave, what Stuart Hall refers to as a twice diasporized process, which is that those who, people who came to the Americas from the old world have, in many instances, returned to the old world and are populated in major global cities in New York, Toronto, um, London, Paris, Amsterdam, and so on. And I felt that this concept of the Black Atlantic um, really helps to emphasize the theme of the OS um, process that we're talking about today which is the stories of courage in the Americas with a focus on resistance to slavery and unity against racism. So in my own work, I have argued that carnivals of the Americas are festivals that act as ritual sites for sociocultural and political contestation, as well as aesthetic resistance. The expressions of liberation, identity, integration, social protest, and street theater. And they've been going for a while. Yeah. So we have images of carnival in Havana, Cuba, 
from the 1880s. This is one of the oldest uh, images that we have. And what's interesting is that some of the art forms and the, the modes of expression that you see are replicated all across the region. So this is one of the oldest images for Trinidad and Tobago Carnival. Um, I'm very familiar with the art forms and the modes of costuming and masquerading in Trinidad. So you will see bats and imps. You would also see things like baby dolls um, and Indians and so on. Similarly, in New Orleans, you find that the masquerade tradition in the United States, particularly in New Orleans, also mirrors what you are seeing in Havana or in Port of Spain. In fact, uh, Mitchell, in his book in nine, written in 1999, argues that the traditional of black people masking Indian is widespread in Caribbean carnival. There are such Indians in Trinidad, Bahia, and Cuba. Christmas mask, maskers in Jamaica, St. Kitts, and the Dominican Republic, which also includes wild Indians. There are Goombe dancers in Bermuda. They also dress as Indians. And with the Mardi Gras Indians, the, wor the working class black people of New Orleans, too, invented a tradition. Now, what's remarkable about this is that Mitchell highlights that this masking of um, an Indian, or what's called Indian, has nothing to do with Hollywood. These costumes were produced way before there was even the film industry. And also, he argues that even though they were happening in disparate locations across the Americas, they were parallel processes. And yes, he does admit that there might have been some communication, particularly through the ports, where we had people moving around and sharing ideas about um, artistic creation and carnivals and festivals. But he says, by and large, these processes were happening independent of each other. Parallel, but independent. And that's quite remarkable. It suggests that there is a, a, an intellectual ferment, but that intellectual ferment is actually drawing on the costuming traditions, particularly of West Africa. And so we see many of the headpieces, although they refer to as Indian, they actually West African traditional masquerade formations. More than a decade ago, I actually had the opportunity to meet Samuel Kinzer, who is the authority on carnivals in the Americas, particularly in the United States. His book on New Orleans Carnival and Mobile, Carna and Mobile which is a small town outside of New Orleans, um, is the, the benchmark literature. We actually had dinner and we were chatting about carnival ad nauseum. One of the interesting quotations I like to use from him, he says, carnival deals with the barriers of the present in daily life, not by tearing them down or turning them topsy-turvy, but by stepping over them and back again in an exemplary, although impractical, enlargement of the everyday. Daily life is enlarged theatrically, and it's also enlarged in a particularly bodily way. So we chatted a lot about this, and he's saying that the body is often used as a site of representation. And you see it particularly in the masquerade traditions where, um, like in the case of Trinidad and Tobago, or a juve, people smear their bodies with oil and mud and cocoa and so on. Many of the products of the plantation economy. And so it's a mode of resisting, but also a mode 
of showing resilience. What was striking about my discussion with Kinzer is this. He says, whereas the carnival theorists in Europe reference class as the basis of, upon which this resistance versus resilience modality works, he argues that the key driving factor in the carnivals of the Americas is race. He says, you can always understand the society that you are dealing with if you understand the carnival. And it's true, in my own country, besides asking people which party they vote for, the most interesting question people can ask you is, what band are you playing in? Often, the answer that you give indicates what class you belong to, or as um, my, my good mentor, uh, Lloyd Best would say, which tribe you belong to. And it's interesting as well, is that one of the biggest bands in Trinidad is called Tribe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, class and race are intersecting. And that's not unusual. The Americas has the most unequal societies on planet Earth. Highest levels of inequality. Uh, if you look at, and I'm sorry, I'm a, an economist. But if you look at the Gini, Gini coefficient, for countries in Latin America, the Caribbean, and North America, they have the highest levels of inequality. And you can map it almost one-to-one. Uh, -one. Depending on your race, it actually determines where you fit in the pecking order. So the populations, the indigenous populations of the Americas are at the bottom of the totem pole. And I was reading something recently which says that the indigenous populations in North America are, have lower life expectancies than indigenous populations in other parts of the world. So even in the richest countries in the world, the indigenous populations are severely marginalized and vulnerable, even to this day. So I went through my catalog of images. And what strikes you about carnivals in the Americas is that they're richly inventive, um, very celebratory. So even while we are critiquing issues of identity and race and class, we are having a good time. And the Russian theorist, who's often quoted when talking about carnival, he argues that carnival is not a spectacle seen by the people. They live in it. And everyone participates because its very idea embraces all the people. So it's not just something that is observed. It's something that is lived. It's a lived practice. Um, in fact, often it's referred to as live arts. When I was reflecting on Bakhtin's notion, I remembered the last time I went to a carnival in Toronto, Caribana. I was there with some friends, and a young woman joined us um, who was from Sri Lanka. And she had recently um, moved to Canada as a refugee. Originally, having moved to Germany and then to Canada. And she was a bit shy about coming out into a big public space. But when we got to the festival and all of the frenzied actions, so dancing, drinking, having a great time, and I was trying to explain to her what Carnival was all about, she said to me, you know, the skinheads wouldn't stand a chance. And I was stunned by this, only to find out that the reason why she had to leave Sri Lanka was that she was part of the Tamil rebels. 
and that she okay. yeah. and she was being persecuted at home and then she had to migrate um, to Germany and there she got beaten up by skinheads and so the reason why she was making this point is that she had never seen so many people of color in a public space but not only that that irrespective of your color was having a good time all together she found this really remarkable and it really gave me a, an opportunity to, to think and reflect upon what we often take for granted because when you grow up in a culture you think that well this applies everywhere and the answer is no In preparation for my presentation, I, I started looking again at some of the literature, and particularly the public discourses in newspapers and so on. And there's this article in the, um, one of the papers in the Dominican Republic, an online paper, and it says the Dominican Carnival each February is a huge celebration. There's an event which the whole family can participate in. And that's one of the things that's striking about Carnival, particularly our carnivals, they're not focused on only the youth or popular culture in a narrow sense of things. The author goes on to say that during those years, Dominicans began to develop their own identity. The traditions and celebrations they then began to enjoy established them as purely Dominican for the first time. Many of its themes today have deep-rooted European and African influences. And they have very strong masquerade um, traditions in the Dominican Republic, particularly the mask. And you see it as well in Puerto Rico. So when you come now to the carnivals that have migrated from the Caribbean and Latin America into North America and Europe, I, I'm using here the case of Notting Hill Carnival in London. And it's interesting, The Guardian had an article that says, a sense of home, Notting Hill Carnival cancellations leave cultural gap. I then went on to read um, the report, which is a strategic review for Notting Hill Carnival. And if you read the preface or, um, or the foreword, by Ken Livingston, I don't know if you remember Ken Livingston, quite a notable um, mayor of London. He says, London is one of the most diverse and culturally dynamic capital cities in the world. In recent years, no event has illustrated this more so than Notting Hill Carnival. And he's quite correct. This is the largest public outdoor event in not just London or the UK, but all of Europe. We have all become familiar with popular media portrayals of what makes a successful carnival. A merry police officer amid spectacular costume designs. Very interesting comment. Why? In Nautical Carnival, they spend three times more money policing the festival than actually on the festival. No wonder the police are so merry. Hmm? It's a huge boon for the police economy. But it also shows the cleavages because often the carnival is viewed as an opportunity for criminal activity. Or when you could always read the newspaper the day after and the first comment that they would make on the BBC and in other news outlets is that Nautical Carnival was a success this year. There were no reported incidences of crime or murder. They wouldn't say that there were hundreds of film crews from all around the world that descended on London to capture it, to portray it back at home on television screens all around the world. They wouldn't say that there are over 100,000 visitors who came to London for the event and generated significant economic returns to the tourist sector. And nor would they say that Notting Hill has become the most important 
public event that generates the highest level of ridership on the tube or anything of that sort. Hmm? So certain elements that makes it so indispensable are eluded from the discourse. So nothing else, as um, Ken Livingston says, is here to stay and therefore the true value of this report lies in its adoption of a long-term strategic approach to the carnival's development. Rex Nettleford argues that to ordinary people, festival arts are more than ministry. They affirm the use of the mask, literally and metaphorically, in coming to terms or coping with an environment that has yet to work in their interests. A society that is yet to be mastered and controlled by them despite the coming of independence. And I also got the opportunity to talk to Rex Nettleford about these ideas and issues. And he is um, the former vice chancellor of the UWI, a noted dancer and choreographer. Um, and what he's really trying to get across here is that the festival arts allows us to have this process of affirming identities, but it also allows for the contestation. And in some of my own work, I argue that carnival is the mechanism by which we mask to unmask the society. In fact, it is during the carnival that you see what the society is all about. The rest of the year, we are really masking behind all the strictures, by all the disciplines of civility, all of that is a masquerade. And it's really in the carnival that we unmask our societies. In an article in 2001, the author commenting on the Brazilian carnival says, since the 1980s, carnival has rapidly whitened up. Poor people can no longer afford the costumes. Either it's the middle class who buys the costumes and often by means of the internet, or it's the tourists who head straight to the parade from the airport. This same phenomenon is happening in my own homeland of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, it's happening almost everywhere. Mm. Carnival has become increasingly gentrified at a global level. Mm. It's become a major industry, highly commercialized and so on. But this is not new. It's since the 1870s and 1880s in New Orleans that we saw the commercialization of that carnival and the merchants beginning to invest in the carnival. And in the late 19th century, you saw the same phenomenon taking place in Port of Spain and Trinidad and Tobago. Why? Because the merchants realized that when there were people carnivaling in town, sales went up. And so they shifted from being against the carnival to being for the carnival and creating an accommodation which required the performers often to start singing not in Yoruba songs or in Patois or in Creole, but in English. So the Anglicization of what we now call Calypso was part of that process. Rio Carnival will earn about $500 million from tourist activities compared to about $15 million that the city authorities have invested in their celebration. I've used this particular quotation because in economics we talk about return on investment. Often our governments are reticent about investing in the arts. Yeah, part of the problem is that we're not documenting it well enough. Um, but when we do document it, there is still a lot of hesitancy about investing in the arts. But here you have it, and it's, um, it's the case throughout the region, and I know fairly well I've done more studies on the economic impact assessment of carnivals and festivals in the region than anyone else. I can claim that to be the case. Um, and the return tends to be pretty high um, in terms of the impact on the macroeconomics of the society, not necessarily at the turnstile in terms of the earnings. In this, in this um, quote, again, from um, Brazil, 
It says, Carnival Industry Transformed Brazil's Shantytown. Tourists for two-day parade in areas they normally wouldn't set foot in. Mm -hmm. And so what it does is also creates spaces that where the economy spreads beyond the center into the peripheries. And in my own homeland, the steel pan, which was once banned, has become the latest percussion instrument in the world. Steel, has, steel pan has become the national instrument. It's on our airline. It's part of the logo. Um, and steel pan has become a major live performance uh, area and an export industry. In fact, I remember growing up, my grandmother saying to me, uh, you know, be careful with steel bands. Huh? Um, your uncles, um, you know, used to get into the steel bands and on occasion, the police would pick them up. Mm. So, we went from that process to one where it has become a respectable element of society now. You can go, activity generates a high rate of return to the economy and society. It's psychic wealth as well as economic wealth. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to suggest that we need to not leave things to chance. That we actually need to do our homework and build our institutional capacity. So for example, in a lot of the work that I've been doing over the years, if not decades, um, the focus has been on documenting, mapping, and increasingly digitizing the content from the carnivals of the Americas. In fact, one of the things I would want to recommend, maybe to the OAS, is the establishment of an observatory for the carnival of the Americas. Some time ago, and I don't want to date myself, but I was a member of an uh, inter-American committee to establish an observatory, an observatory for the creative and cultural policies in the Americas, which was organized by the OAS. Uh, maybe the OAS can play a critical role here in terms of rallying to this cause. I'm also that we need to create a virtual and roving carnival museum of the Americas. This is something that I had prepared and made a presentation on for a Ministers of Culture meeting oh so long ago in Port of Spain, Trinidad, at the invitation of the then Minister of Culture. Um, there was a lot of interest at the moment, but um, it never materialized. I think the technologies of today allow us to do this in a more seamless way than ever. I am suggesting that this museum could be both virtual and roving. So every year it could be in another jurisdiction. There are enough carnivals all across the Americas for us to have content ad infinitum. The other area we have been involved in for a long time as well is training of artists, administrators, and entrepreneurs on strategic management of carnivals and other festivals. At the UB campus in St. Augustine, um, I was one of the co-founders of what's called Arts and Cultural Enterprise Management Program, where we've been training people for almost 15 years in these areas. It's important that we do so. Why? Often when I go to ministries of culture, all across the region, people haven't been trained in this area. They don't understand the ways in which the cultural and creative sector differs from other sectors. This wouldn't happen in a ministry of agriculture or in a ministry of energy. The people who work there at a professional level have been trained in the area. So that's something that we need to correct. And then last but not least, we need to secure our intellectual property so that our creative assets can be strengthened through things like our copyright societies and so on. Already our copyright societies are monitoring 
um, the way in which our music is being utilized around the world and we collect our royalties. Not enough, one would argue, but nonetheless the institutional capacity is already fairly well developed. So this is an area where at the college we are working with colleagues from UWI in St. Augustine and Jamaica um, to build out an intellectual property accelerator where we will train people about this area. We're getting funding through the Caribbean Development Bank, the Creative Industries Innovation Fund. So many thanks to the Caribbean Development Bank for that. We are also working with colleagues to do a festival tourism accelerator where, again, we will be training people on the modalities of festival tourism and the ways in which it's a critical driver of both the tourism sector and the creative sector. The, my last point is that I view carnival and the festivals that have emanated from the Caribbean and the wider Latin American region and including North America, particularly New Orleans, as a global social movement. Often, when we talk about social movements, we think of very didactic forms of rebellion and revolution and social protest and so on. There's a way in which the arts and festivals seep into people's consciousness. Not by beating them over the head, but by getting them to dance. By getting them to celebrate who they are, by getting them to accept the other, and by these means, carnival has become a global social movement, and the carnivals of the Americas have played a critical role in terms of reshaping modernity. And so the concept of the Black Atlantic helps us to elaborate on this element but also, I would argue, celebrate this dimension of who we are. I want to thank you very much for your kind attention and uh, pass it back to you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Nurse. Very interesting concepts and ideas that you've brought up here. I'm sure your audience in the room and online have a lot of questions and a lot of comments on what you've just said. I think we have a, com a commentator, and I would like to invite Ms. Tracy Pilgrim-George to actually introduce the, our commentator. Dr. Yannick Hume is an interdisciplinary scholar, priestess, dancer, and choreographer who specializes in the festive and sacred arts and popular cultures of the Caribbean and broader African diaspora. She is head of the Department of Cultural Studies and lecturer at the University of West Indies Cave Hill campus. Dr. Hume is the co-editor of Caribbean Cultural Thought, From Plantation to Diaspora, 2013. Caribbean Popular Culture, Power, Politics and Performance, 2016. And Passages and Afterwards, Anthropological Perspectives on Death and the Caribbean, 2018. She has also conducted substantial research on the creative and cultural industries of the Caribbean. She is president of COSENBA, which is the Scholarly Association for the Study of Haitian Voodoo and other Africana religions, and is a member of the Hemispheric Caribbean Studies Consortium. As a dancer and a choreographer, Dr. Hume has worked with companies in her native Jamaica, as well as Cuba, Haiti, and Brazil. She is the recipient of grants from the Social Science Research Council, the International Development Research Center, Ford Foundation, 
and the Wiener Grand Foundation for Anthropological Research. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Dr. Yannick Hume. Dr. Um, in fact, on today's presentation, several things came to mind. I was indeed intrigued by the, the choice of Black Atlantic, and I see how it works quite um, generously to begin to engage in some of the themes that Dr. Nurse presents to us. Indeed, the term Afro-Atlantic, Black Atlantic, has been circulating for some time, but what um, Paul Gilroy did with this work is really begin to engage it from the depth of hybridity and the space of hybridity and what that then offers us as a conceptual framework to begin to engage black cultures as they move. Um, some of the critiques that have been launched um, against, well, encountered to the work or at least to trouble it somewhat because it was indeed a, a really positive work. But um, some of the, the commentary about its limitations, and I could see how it may function in terms of looking at what we're doing here, is there was this primacy given to the North. There's a way in which when we engage the Black Atlantic, the Black Atlantic becomes the North Atlantic. And by this, I'm speaking specifically of the global um, metropolitan centers of the North of which many of our Caribbean nationals have made their homes. And while there it is, has become a generative space to begin to engage with the export of culture and the ways in which um, cultures of the peripheries move into the centers, some of what has been happening is that those centers have become the, the, the new representations of what the peripheries had as its indigenous form. What do I mean by this? When we look at the various ranges of culture, of um, expressive forms within the festive traditions of the Caribbean, there's a lot of room to begin to engage in cr the cross fertilizations and potential hybridities within the South, right? So as we begin to engage this concept of Black Atlantic, I want us to also recognize that the South has to be front and center in that conversation. Because what happens is that in metropolitan spaces usurp the primacy of the Southern spaces. And what's happening between um, the cross fertilizations that are happening with Panama and Brazil, with Brazil and Trinidad, and the potentialities of those, right? As not only spaces that we could begin to study these processes, but also spaces of air areas that our artists could cast their nets, right? There's a tendency to look to the North as the only frontier. And um, I want to encourage us that there is a lot of opportunities to look at having our artists move. Uh, and we see this with Soka artists moving within the, the realm of the carnivals in the Caribbean but the entire South America is open as well. And we, we really need to begin to look at those spaces where we could um, address this. And certainly, I remember the earliest conversations I've had with Dr. Nurse, I, I would say back in 2009, it would have been about the Carnivals of the Americas Museum, virtual museum, ro virtual and roving museum. At that time, it would seem like, uh, so far off, but the fact is we are living in a metaverse, we're living in a virtual world, and so it makes it even more possible. And the, the questions about those South-South connections of which I'm mentioning becomes even more poignant and, and feasible to express and, and to, and to um, engage in such a space. And I'm thinking even thematically, 
When we look at some of the traditions across the Americas, the carnival traditions across the Americas, from the Devil Mass of Portobello, Panama, to the Diab or the Diablo Mass or Masquerade in the Dominican Republic, to the Diab of the Carnival in Jacmel, and to the Devil Mass of Trinidad and its counterpart in Grenada, we see there a possibility of taking one carnival character that finds itself across a range of territories, across a range of historical experiences, linguistic and colonial um, uh, diversities. Yet still this mass presents itself, it presents itself time again. It is part of the social fabric of many of our societies um, of the Americas. And if you could imagine a carnival, uh, a virtual museum, being able to track that visually, track that aesthetically through the costuming, track that sonically through the soundscape of which this mask becomes manifest and, and, and roams the streets of these various territories. Whether we're talking about, you know, the countries that I've mentioned, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Panama, Grenada, um, and Trinidad, and many more in between. So there is spaces to begin to even conceive of this um, conceptually, thematically looking through characters and looking at how you could map this sonically and aesthetically through costumes and so forth. And when we think also of the synergies, when we look at the Circum Caribbean, and by this I'm using uh, performance studies scholar Joseph Roach's concept of the Circum Caribbean, of which spaces like um, Barranquilla, Colombia, San Andres, so the islands off of the coast of, of Colombia, also um, the areas of blue fields, Nicaragua, of, of Costa Rica, of um, Panama, and of New Orleans gets, gets incorporated within this idea of a Circum Caribbean of an Americas that cuts, that, that runs beyond the, the North America Caribbean matrix to also um, take into consideration our Southern neighbors. And when we think about, for example, the cross fertilizations between the uh, masquerade like baby doll and what that looks like in terms of the histories of intimacies between the United States and the Caribbean between spaces like Haiti and New Orleans, as well as New Orleans and, and Trinidad. What are these, what are these um, circle, these, uh, the, how does the circulation of cultures exist in these spaces? And of course, um, Paul Gilroy's concept of the Black Atlantic and his work on hybridity affords for this kind of analysis. But what it then, what we can then do is begin to engage it also, not only as a phenomenon of Not Notting Hill, or phenomenon of Toronto and Caravana, or phenomenon of, of um, the uh, Labor Day, uh, was it the West Indian Parade in, in Brooklyn, on, in Flatbush, right? But we could also look at those experiences in our backyards, literally, and what it looks like in the Americas um, a little further south. I, in, in thinking about this also, I was drawn to um, you know, a way in which the sacred operates within this. It's, it's become really interesting to see as these festival forms migrate um, from their original locales or localities, the increasing secularization that happens within them and the increased ways of which um, some of the aesthetic practices of, uh, that undergirded them become... Um, diluted in a sense because we, we find a, uh, a dependency for example on made made in china goods we find a dependency on a circulation of a template a template of a particular kind of mass and mass is in mass consumption mass culture as well as mass masquerade so we see this circulation of a template for masking that in effect denudes the aesthetic practices that are indigenous to the spaces of which it ends up. So I speak of this when you have the beads and feathers, right? Becoming the, the trope for which we begin, or the aesthetic trope 
for beginning to even imagine mass. And the damage does that does in terms of um, denuding the, the, the ability for um, Caribbean peoples living in other territories who adopt carnival traditions from spaces like Trinidad, let's say, and doesn't incorporate the aesthetic values, the principles, um, the modalities of expressions within their incorporation of an inherited carnival form, right? And we have to be mindful of that as these models begin. And this is where, when we're talking about tourism and the, the ways in which we adopt certain forms as it moves across territories, not all shoes fit the same way. And we have to recognize if we're going to borrow something or use something that works in one sociocultural context, we have to be sensitive to how does it then enter into the new, con the new context of which it's functioning. And I, I speak of this in, um, in particular reference to, for example, the Jamaica Carnival and the decades long fight between those who believe, who see this as a bourgeois imp imposition, who see this as an up imposition, where in the indigenous mass forms coming from John Canoe are completely invisible within the realm of a carnival tradition. A carnival tradition that essentially becomes watered down into a fete, right? There's a fete after fete after fete, where that kind of idea of how do we begin to invigorate a, a, a local created economy using mass as a driving force, where we're not just going on Amazon and ordering supplies from China, but we are creating those supplies from our husk, from our banana wire, from all the things that we have in our backyards to integrate that into a revived sense of an aesthetic, aesthetic modalities for creating mass anew. And this becomes particularly urgent in this post-pandemic moment when we are forced to think ourselves anew and we are forced to also recognize our need to be more self-reliant, our need to be reliant on each other as our regional brothers and sisters in a, in a, in a more um, hemispheric way I'm speaking of, but also reliant on the knowledge, the tradition bearers, those indigenous aesthetics principles that are part of that uh, core of knowledge bearers of our Caribbean that oftentimes get sidelined when we go for the mass and forget that we also need to incorporate the smaller communities that will add a certain difference to that mass, a differentiation. Because when we have a carnival experience, it's not simply about the, the, the music and the drinking and the whining and all of that. It's also been a main marker within the tourism framework for destination branding. It has been one of the main ways in which the Caribbean, as Dr. Nurse offers, presents itself to a global market. It's the ways in which the Caribbean becomes visible. And it's the ways in which marginal communities, pockets within our own Caribbean countries become visible. What we call a kind of performance of this visibility, a masking to unmask, a masking to bring to the fore things that are often unspoken Right? And this becomes particularly the case when we look at um, even our Haitian brothers and sisters and their mass traditions, which falls into two categories. You have their hara tradition, which is a six-week Lenten tradition, very much linked to the sacred arts, and also it's carnival, which follows right on that. That en masse, when, when Dr. Nurse speaks about these global carnival as a global social movement, we see how the emphasis on the mass becomes a saving grace for those who feel, who are materially, economically, politically disenfranchised. The mass parade becomes the space in which those voices get heard, where they can actually be present and, and not run the risk of being annihilated, assassinated, because they are in en masse. And so we need to consider all of these things and these various trajectories as we go forward. You know, underlying, and underlying, and I'm going to just look at my notes here, but critical theme 
in discussing festive and masculine politics in the Caribbean um, is the place also of the sacred within these forms, right? Whether submerged because of the onslaught of, onslaught of secularization or activated as part of expanding folkloric repertoires in late socialist Cuba, for example, um, Caribbean festivals, practices, and cultural performances slide seamlessly along a continuum of sacred and secular registers. We seldom, we seldom reflect on this, that many of these forms are indeed embedded in sacred systems, wisdom systems that have been passed down. When we look at the Raranga or the Jankunu of Belize, embedded within a sacred system. When we look at some of the earliest Jankunu still performed within Conca St. Elizabeth, embedded within an ancestral veneration rite. Um, so when we're teaching these forms, so when we're beginning to, um, to explore them, even with the increased monetization of these forms, we have to also be able to teach the history of these forms beyond what we are seeing now, beyond the discussion about um, their, their economic might and worth, beyond the expediency of their economic, their, their, their strength of their as economic resources, which is a powerful thing for our, for developing a sustained economic um, bedrock. But you could only sustain that if the people who are engaged in the exercise are knowledge about the knowledgeable about the exercises they're engaged in, that they understand that they too have a buy-in to this that is beyond um, beyond the cents and dollars that it gives them a drive to continue to be resilient, continue to um, want to engage in a level where they feel that they're seen, where they're able to reclaim the very cultures of which these traditions come from, and that they're able to also engage in a practice with, of renewal. We tend to speak about resilience, but resilience could only take you so far. You could be resilient until you're not. You could be resilient until you burn out. So what are we doing to encourage and ensure that there are practices, there are processes of which renewal becomes part of that sense of rejuvenation and resiliency, that we, our governments, our, our artists are feeling that sense of, um, of, of, of um, a sense of ownership and an ownership not because it's, it's, it, of its export value, Yes, but an ownership because it means something to self. It means something to an explanation of who we are as a people now and who we are as a people of descendants of a past, multiple pasts, multiple histories that have converged here in this crucible we call the Caribbean. So there's lots of spaces as we think about how do we explore the festive and sacred arts, how do we explore masquerade politics, how do we explore carnival, and recognizing that there's many ways of which the carnivalesque makes its appearance in the Caribbean, that there's not only one carnival, that there's multiple carnivals in their expressivity, and that we have to leave space, especially as we move towards a desire to explore um, the export of this form. When we think about hybridity, we really need to hold that dear. What does hybridity mean for us as a people whose livelihood has always been about migration? And the very fact that as we move, we take those things that are dearest to us with us. And so as we're taking those things with us and incorporating them with the spaces of which we make home, there's an importance to always being mindful of also looking at those spaces, those aesthetic principles and core values and traditions that exist in those spaces that these traditions are coming into to really create vibrant, hybrid modalities to play mass and to be on the road and to be and to be and to be. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hume. Very incisive comments here. I think we'll generate some more conversation as we go along. Um, we're already getting um, responses from online, but I'm sure Dr. Ness would like to lead with the response to the commentator. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fulgen. Yeah, uh, there's not much I could add to or comment on the commentator. <laughs> I think she did an excellent job of um, both rounding off and expanding my discourse. Um, I agree with her that the, the, um, the notion of a black Atlantic, as articulated by Gilroy, is a contested space. Uh, on the way in which I attempted to use it was to actually center the, um, the periphery, um, to move away from the North Atlantic to take into account the wider Atlantic. The, the issue of um, seeing, and, and this is that point, the point that um, Dr. Hume ended on, which I think is so important, utilizing our indigenous art forms as a basis for renewal and for reinventing ourselves. There's a way in which, when you look at the Caribbean, and I would argue the wider Latin America and North America, I think we have hit uh, the doldrums. Our societies, in terms of social innovation, are largely tapped out. I am not seeing a process of reinvention taking place. I am seeing a regression taking place. And this is definitely evident in the political arena, but it's also evident in the economic arena. If you look at the data, and I know this well, because this is my core area of research, is that if you look at the data for, let's say, the global middle class, whereas Whereas Europe and North America accounted for 60% of the global middle class up till 1980 and 2000, it's estimated by 2040, 2050, 60% of the global middle class is going to be in Asia. North America and Europe's share is, dro is dropping to 30%, if not below. The rest of the Americas because our, our wagon is hitched towards North America and Europe, is also in decline in relative terms. It means then that unless we begin to engage in this process of renewal and reinvention, we should expect to become poorer societies, to become more fractious societies, more dangerous societies. It is our arts, festivals, and carnivals, I'm arguing, among other traditions, that allow us and provide us with the flexibility to reinvent ourselves from a position of cultural confidence. And it is that lack of cultural confidence, or the absence of it, that has been our undoing. No longer can we accept that development is scripted in some narrowly defined historical framework. Those days are over. It is now incumbent on us to use our various cultural expressions, our modes of thinking, our own epistemologies to frame a new narrative. The time is upon us now. This is no longer uh, theoretical matter, this has actually become increasingly a life and death matter. So I want to thank Dr. Hume for expanding <laughs> and, um, and, and even exploding the topic into um, additional realms. Uh, she's done it very expertly. So thank you very much, Dr. Hume. OK, thank you. <laughs> we'll now take questions from our audience. We have a roving mic, so just raise your hand and we'll take your question. But in the meantime, I'd like to give some of the questions online. Um, there's one, the first one on Zoom is, wow, Dr. Nurse, ne you need to come to Toronto and give the speech. Maybe then levels of government would better understand why Caribana needs better funding from the various levels of Canadian government, municipal, 
provincial and federal, relevant not just to the Caribbean. Okay, another question from Zoom. Dr. Nurse, do you think that the use of Indians was a tribute to the native indigenous peoples in the western part of the world in which our peoples live? A way of connecting to the roots of the new sense of our place. Okay, those, those are two big ones. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me try and engage. I'll start with the last one. Um, we are not quite sure um, because, you know, when cultures move, uh, they don't remain static. They are very dynamic. Um, so uh, what's interesting is that if you look at some of the West African tradition in terms of masquerade, uh, particularly the use of the headpiece and, and how the costuming is kinetic, um, has become really the DNA of the costuming traditions in the Americas. And it's also that these art forms are composite art forms. So the masquerading is no good without the music. Uh, you don't perform um, a costume, you dance it. Right. And I remember very distinctly, um, this was, would have been in London, uh, you, we had an experience where um, a masquerade producer produces beautiful costume. It was absolutely marvelous. And uh, it was portrayed um, in the Royal Albert Hall. And it was on stage. And we all loved it. Two days later, when they tried to take it on the road, the first big breeze that blew mashed it up. So, in our costuming tradition, we cater for the outdoor. We don't do these things for indoor. And so, in terms of the design, the engineering, and the application of the science, um, the public and the outdoor comes into play. So, these traditions have evolved from both the, the West African tradition, in particular, and one way well um, accept that there is a, um, an anthropological explanation of how the indigenous peoples of the Americas and the cultures that came to the Americas from the old world morphed um, and involved in such process of synchronism. Um, and so, um, this is something that is part of the historical record uh, in relation to the, to, to the arts. Um, it, the, the masking of an Indian is a very intricate um, process. We see it a lot of Trin in Trinidad Carnival still, uh, even though it has declined and has moved into peripheral species. It's starting to get a bit of a resurgence. They even have their own language that they um, speak in, perform in. Uh, I had done a presentation like this in Toronto a long time ago, uh, at the University of Toronto, in fact. Uh, there was a major conference there on carnivals. So I, I welcome the opportunity to return to Toronto and have the, this, this discussion. Uh, but I've been going to Toronto more recently for the Toronto International Film Festival, because that's one of my other areas. Of, um, of work. I'm the chairman of Caribbean Tales Worldwide Distribution. We're the largest distributor of Caribbean film in the world, we argue. We have the largest catalog of Caribbean film. And we've been running an incubator for filmmakers in Toronto. What's interesting is that Toronto International Film Festival is one of the largest generators of, of income for the city of Toronto. And so the city of Toronto has been investing massively in this festival. Yes, I would argue that one of the challenges that the carnivals, what I call the diaspora Caribbean carnivals, is that they are often operating from um, the back foot position. They're always operating from position of being always on the defensive. And that's because 
the carnivals that evolved in the Caribbean and in the Americas, when they migrated, they migrated with the same DNA, which is that you see the same level of, of critique by the state that would have happened in the late 19th century, early 20th century in Latin America and Caribbean. You see that playing out again in North America and in Europe. Huh? Um, Brixton riots in London, um, you know, issues in, in New York, and, and all of the, the major cities. And what's interesting, and I've interviewed many of the people who started these carnivals, and I would ask, um, you know, I'd ask, why did you start the carnival? Um, and why do you require that it goes through the city center? And almost everyone has said, we want to make sure that people know that we are here. That's why we are going to parade right through downtown. Spaces that we don't normally inhabit. Spaces that are, are there for Wall Street moguls. We want to pass right through those spaces. And so it's a means by of, of creating visibility, but it's also a means by which they reclaim or occupy space. So they, I've worked over the years with um, those who organize the Diaspora Caribbean Carnivals. And they suffer also from the same challenges that our festivals and carnivals have on this side. They're not properly documented. They're not measuring their economic impact assessment. They can't tell you if they have more masqueraders and, and performers this year than last year or 10 years ago. Um, and the list goes on. So in a modern economy, you have to be able to leverage your position by, um, by making sophisticated arguments in the halls of, of, and corridors of power and, um, and creating strategic linkages with all kinds of stakeholders. And I think that that's part of the, the challenge. But it's a very hostile environment. Uh, I've sat through many of the committee meetings for Notting Hill Carnival, for example, and um, um, in some respects, it was almost shameless, shameful to see the ways in which dominant institutions would treat um, um, the, the festival organizers, um, even though they are generating millions, if not billions of dollars in income for those societies and, and economies. So. Thank you, Dr. Nurse. I have another question here. In fact, I'll piggyback on this question. Um, Calix George via YouTube, a comment on YouTube. It, is certainly, it has certainly become gentrified. I'll, if carnival is a microcosm or a representation of the society, is the gentrification we're seeing a representation of what's happening in the wider society? Good question. <laughs> a hard question. Uh, there is a very um, iconic publication on Trinidad Carnival um, in the quarterly review, I think it was published in 1956. So this is even before Trinidad and Tobago was independent. And there's an article by, uh, I think, an American scholar called Barbara Puri. And in it, she talks about the middle classes in Carnival. And she makes a statement that, uh, I, it, that has stuck with me. She goes, for the middle classes, Carnival is all about the excitement factor. And I was like, wow. She wrote this in 1956 or in 1950s. And if you look at the evolution of the carnivals, that has really always been the case. The middle classes have tended to be um, uh, wanting to mirror the dominant classes and to disassociate themselves from the so-called underclasses. And it is the underclasses that generated the art form. So the process of gentrification is not new. In fact, one can argue it is embedded in the carnival. That's why I'm arguing that the carnival actually allows us to unmask the society. This gentrification process has been long with us. In fact, it is 
embedded in the DNA of the festival and of the carnival. Uh, so, there are ups and downs, there are periods of peaks and troughs, and in a period where we are seeing increasing inequality globally and regionally, we will see um, this process of increasing bifurcation, whereby um, the, um, the middle classes are able to control both the production as well as the consumption of the art form. And it's a worrying trend because um, ordinary people are, are being priced out of the, um, of the carnivals. What it does, though, is create an opportunity for creating new means of articulating in the carnival. And that is what we've seen over time. So when people get closed out of certain spaces, they create new spaces. And, uh, and so it's a moving target. It's never fixed, it's never um, complete, and it's never finished. It's an ongoing, um, it's an ongoing process of, of debate and reinvention as we proceed. So I, I, I hope that in part answers the question. It's a tough one, but it's okay. uh, an important question. Okay, thank you. We have a question from the audience. Good afternoon all. Laurent Jean-Pierre, Jomo. Very interesting, Dr. K um, the economics of, of, of Carnival, but I want to shift the geography of reason to what I call the ecstasy of Carnival. Um, more or less, Carnival is more than just the economics, as, we, as you rightly know, but also what you express a sort of a catharsis where people let go. It's at a period where you bust in and we let go. You know, you, there's no rules, kind of. There is rules, but there is no rules. You dance if any woman you want. You whine on any woman you want. You know, she whining you back. You know, it's like we let it go. You know, with all the stress and all the struggles of life. And even just before Lent, you have the, the what you call the juve, where you stone the undesirable. And in the Islamic culture there's something like that when you stone the azazel the devil and we seem to have that kind of it's a time to let go all the stress and you know and so forth so i think i would like you to speak to that part of the of carnival apart from the economic part of it but looking at the areas of um wonderment that goes into it and the areas of um uh when you move from dropping all your troubles you know, and, and even in the Kaiso, the music, what's the documentation of our history? And, and when you have people like Chogdas and the other fellas telling you about Windows Sparrow, about, you know, there's a lot of documentation of what has been happening in our society. That's also part of Carnival. And, and, and um, when, when, when Shadow tell you, forget your troubles and dance, was it Shadow? Or one of them will tell you, we don't have to go to college to dance, to the beat of the music, dance, dance, let it go. Let go the stress. You know, you, you know what I'm talking about? That aspect of carnival, it cannot be put in dollars and cents. It's a thing we do, you know, to free up ourselves, to, to express ourselves. And of course, the documentation with as a young boy, I mean, all the about Sparrow, Sparrow singing about, the world can never miss a man, so since the death of Christ, and Lord, it was terrible, oh, what a sacrifice. He's talking about the death of Kennedy. You know, and in all of them calypso, he said, one time, he, he, when they had the pool, you interest in that. He says, boy, January, say, don't ask me. I've got New Year's Day, no one can take away. February, ring CDC and say, how the hell you could live with me and march and put carnival in me? It's telling us about what's going on in our society. So it's an important commentary and an ecstasy. And Jomo. This, Jomo. Yes, yeah, speak to this kind of in importance of carnival for our own sanity and letting go the desirable and freeing up ourselves. Well, thank you very much and for your rendition as well. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> I can assure you I can't um, match you in that regard. Um, in Trinidad, we, we use the word Lego. Um, and in Calypso, um, it's referred to as a lavoy. 
Um, it's like riding the rhythm, as they say in Jamaica, or um, reinterpreting the song. Um, always in jazz, um, that um, means by which you can um, frame new rhythms as you are going along. So um, there's, a, there's a very rich inventive tradition built into the carnival arts, and particularly the music. So I, I'm fully on board with you on that. The, the issue, though, is this. Um, yes, there is this component, but it's also at play with other issues. Uh, so for example, what we are noticing is this. The arena of, let's call it, contention and contestation has moved from one issue area into other issue areas. So up till the 1960s, early 70s, uh, let's say Trinidad and Tobago, which I'm very familiar with, of course, um, most of the masqueraders would have been a male, and the kinds of costuming, very male-centric, if I could use that term. So um, we were playing things like sailor, army, fireman, etc. cetera. Um, from, my, from the mid-1970s, we started to see more women participation in the carnival, and the costuming started to change. It's also that the, 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 um, the music started to change. It moved from being performed um, in calypso tents to now in what we call big fets. So you move from having audience sizes of hundreds to audience sizes now of thousands. And uh, the, the script changes. And the issues of female participation in the public space becomes the new arena for contestation. Uh, so it is um, our dearly departed Pat Bishop who argues that the, the female body on display in the public space is itself, even when they're wearing beads and feathers only, and very little of it, um, that that is in part a process by which the carnival is expressing some area of resistance and rebellion as well. It is Kitchener, the Calypsonian, who references these women. He calls them the doctor's daughters. I don't know if you remember that Calypso. Hmm? And so the, these are, the, you want me to sing it? <laughs> I apologize. Um, that, that's really outside of my capabilities. Um, but yeah, so the doctor's daughters are hidden from view for most of the year. But you see them on the road come the Lego. <laughs> All right? So, yes, we may be concerned about the feathers and beads and that we need to be doing our indigenous manufacturing of the costumes and not importing it from China. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Um, but it's these same feathers and beads that are adorning our women when they go into the public space on Carnival Monday and Tuesday or whenever it is. Um, so there's this interesting dynamic. And so it, 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 it really expresses some of the issues that you see. But one thing I keep uh, emphasizing is that if you look at the steel ban movement in Trinidad and Tobago, particularly at secondary school level, the girls are now outnumbering boys significantly. So it is not just about feathers and beads and the body being performed in a public space. Young women are the, the new wave of composers as well, as well as performers in the steel bands. And I predict that in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, young males are going to be in the minority. It was, it, the steel pan will have become totally dominated by women. It's because the young women are learning music in school, not the young men. And so as the industry professionalizes, they are able to be more adept in moving into the spaces. 
And so, um, when we talk about gentrification, it is that we live in the world. We live in a capitalist economy. We live in an economy where modernity is invested in. And unless you are moving, you are falling behind. As, as Carlota Perez, or the Venezuelan economist, talks about development as a moving target. It means that if you are not continuously investing and reinvesting in yourself and in your society, it means that you're falling behind. Um, so I think in the area of gender, um, our young men have to step up. <laughs> yeah? um, and we also have to help them to create new spaces for themselves. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a great question. Thank you very much. Okay, we have another question from the audience. Good afternoon, good evening, Dr. Nuth. I was just like to, I, I would just like to comment on our friend there about letting go. Oh, I that for a while. I remember some discussion on the streets. You know, they were talking about a bank girl and a vagrant. And apparently, the vagrant, sorry, the bank girl was letting go, and the vagrant was having a good time. Mm. So, so later on, it reverts that during the normal, normal activities, the girl will be in the, office, in the bank and wouldn't know the vagrant anymore, mm. <laughs> you know? That's just this idea of letting go, you know, in that space, you know? But I just want to talk about also gent gentrification and also the um, more or less concept of innovation. Now, I also remember hearing in Trinidad discussions about the uh, old-time Labantil gangs. They were the steel band gangs, and they would be running around and fighting, and that was where carnival started in Trinidad. And then later on, the people from Woodbrook, they picked it up, and that's how you had this more middle class coming in. Now, you have the steel pan, and later on, the steel pan, I think it was first patented by, I think, the Japanese or the Swedes, and later on, Trinidad also patented it. Maybe we can look at these things in terms of innovation, and or they also speak about uh, wire bending. We can also look at all those things and innovation and patenting, you know, as we go forward to turn it into also the commercial adventure, you know. Okay, well, let me just make, I'll make a comment on your last component there. Um, so one of my colleagues um, from UWI, Sharon Legall, she wrote her PhD thesis on intellectual property and the steel pan. Um, we need to be talking about geographical indications and the ways in which copyright and so on are, are part of this mix. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, if you look at the Copyright Act, works of mass is embedded in the Copyright Act. It's the only country in the world where the term works of mass is represented. Um, it's also rec recognized by the World Intellectual Property Organization. So no, we are also, you know, making our felt ourselves heard and understood in global spaces as well. What is, um, and it comes back to the point from the previous uh, question, um, we have seen the re-emergence of ropes to keep the audiences away from those same middle class women in the bands. Of course, there's issues of concern there for the women's safety and so forth. But in a recent um, discussion, online discussion on these matters, um, where Trinidad was hosting this year's carnival and they were creating um, pods at the various venues, um, it reminded me that in the late 19th century, early 20th century, the middle classes uh, opted to parade in downtown Port of Spain on floats and not on the road. You see this in the Brazil Carnival as well, in the Samba Drome, um, they use floats a lot. Um, you, see the, you see the floats being used particularly in Europe, also in North America, for ordinary parades. Uh, so being on the road though is a really important element of our modality of um, a parading. You're not doing a real parade and you're not masquerading if you're not on the road. What we're seeing 
happening is, is that uh, I'm seeing in Trinidad, I'm seeing it in, in Kingston, I'm seeing it in many other locations, is that the road has changed as well. So they're now going and parading in middle class communities, not downtown. Um, so, so as not to come into contact with the working classes and the underclasses. Yeah? Um, and so it's a really interesting dynamic. And it's, a, you know, it's moving, it's shifting. Dr. Nassau, so you, um, you, you have Pekong in your presentation? <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have a question here. Good afternoon. Thank you for a very insightful lecture. I have two questions. The first is tied to speaking about the ecosystem of carnival, because for a lot of people, carnival is just people on a road for two days or one day for how many number of days. So I wondered if you could elaborate on the work and the various artists and craftsmen that go into the industry. And the second part deals with monetization. While we speak about Carnival as a multi-million, in some instance, billion dollar industry, I often wonder, in terms of the creators versus those who monetize it, how is it actually structured? So can you speak to, from your studies, who actually benefits economically from it? Because reflecting, I'm wondering if it just mirrors our tourism product where the resources and the branding and everything is local, but the wealth is repatriated elsewhere. OK, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've been working on this for um, more than two decades now. So I've interviewed and followed the work of many artists, performers, uh, entrepreneurs, and so on. Uh, I once met this young woman who um, sells roti at different carnivals. She does that for six months of the year and earns enough income to satisfy her for the whole year. I was quite, you know, uh, I was, this is remarkable. She goes, yeah, I just make sure to organize myself, and I go to the various carnivals. She lives in Trinidad, but she goes to New York, Toronto, and she does that. All right. um, I, I interviewed, um, let's see if I remember his name correctly now. Um, he'll come back to me. But the... Let me talk about some of the Calypso artists or the reggae artists or the performers. Um, if you make a hit song, let's say a Trinidad Carnival, um, you have guaranteed gigs abroad for at least two years. Uh, if the song remains pretty popular. Um, I have seen artists and I know they don't like me talking about the numbers, and maybe I shouldn't, um, because anytime I, they see me, they say, you know, Dr. Nurse, it's because of you, the tax man is coming to look for me. <laughs> All right, so I won't give the numbers, but let me say, put it this way. I'm talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in US currency. All right, um, and so you see the um, particularly Toronto Tobago Carnival as the destination for other artists from other territories. So you have to go there to make sure you get a hit and from there you're able to circulate the globe and have um, your weekends booked out, so there are 52 weekends in the year um, they can get 40 plus weekends booked out for the year and for the following year. Just do the math. Um, and so often, um, that is a really critical source of income. You're also seeing, and, and this is, I, I met, um, uh, in fact, I used to go mountain bike cycling with this guy from Barbados, a Calypsonian performer. He stopped performing in Barbados because he got onto the cruise ship circuit, as well as the international hotel circuit. So he lived six months out of the year outside of Barbados and six months back in Barbados riding his mountain bike. And his mountain bike is several times more expensive than my mountain bike. Hmm? I can't afford it, what he has. Um, but you know what? He says he has to have in his repertoire somewhere between 250 and 500 songs. 
he, so when he's back in Barbados, he does his whole work. He is training, voice training. He's learning new, um, expanding his, his repertoire, his catalog, etc., etc., etc. Right? Now, of course, there are those the bigger entrepreneurs, who, particularly in the masquerade area, who are able to earn significant income. Um, and I'm talking millions here now. Um, and then there are those who run some of the recording studios, um, the film studios, and so on, who are major entrepreneurs and are generating significant returns. Um, but what is important is this, and this is where some of my work has been in, engaged, along with colleagues like Dr. Joanne Tull, is that we've been training a cadre of young entrepreneurs how to tap into these markets. And the thing is that it's evolving very quickly. So my recent work is now focused on blockchain, right? And seeing how the creative sector has become part of FinTech. Um, so that if we are still thinking about the creative arts as just performance, we are no longer in the game. And if our governments are not talking about e-commerce, talking about um, the ways in which data localization and data monetization are the new driver of income generation in the creative sector, we are out of the game. All right? So, to quote again, Carlota Perez, she says, development is a moving target. If you're not keeping up with the techno-economic paradigms and as they shift and move, you are going to be left behind or in, put into reverse. And so, we are not doing that fast enough. We, are, we don't have the centers of training and excellence embedded in our tertiary institutions well enough in the Caribbean. Um, and so, um, we are doing this at our own peril. Uh, and for me, this is where the crux of the matter is. The question is, are you preparing yourselves to take an expanded share of the global value added, or you are not. And in most cases, I would argue, we are not doing this fast enough and with the required vigor to keep up with what's happening globally. That's a, let me give one more point. I went to a workshop in China on these matters. I mean, every time I go to China, I am startled. So Shanghai, for example, was growing 10% every year, the city. And in this workshop, the Chinese talked about how they were going to build 300 new theaters, and they were going to do X, Y, and Z. And then one of the people who was participating in the workshop from Thailand came to see me. They said, oh, you're Keith Nurse. You know, your program that you created at St. Augustine campus called Arts and Cultural Enterprise Management. We've been looking at it and we've replicated it. And they showed me what they were doing. I was like, wow, they've gone way past us. So whereas we are still debating whether we should be doing this or not, and we were pioneers at one stage, oh, we are now playing catch up. We now have to go and ask the Thai, the Thai people, oh, can you help us um, figure out these things? Um, we are not taking enough, uh, making enough investment in our future. If you don't invest in your future, you are not going to be creating a future that you can be proud of. Kunti Fanal. Okay, thank you. Um, go ahead. Um, Dr. Nuss, let me um, join my other colleagues in thanking you for a very insightful an interesting presentation. I, I like the economics of it and the way you've um, presented it. And, and there are so many aspects of your presentation that are comment worthy. I'll try to pick um, three of them. One, you made the point that um, about the um, anglicizing of carnival. Um, a few years ago, um, I, I like to consider myself a Calypso, but and a few years ago I was looking and listening to some music from Trinidad. It's a collection of music from 
1918 to 1928, 1928 to 38, 38 to 48. Mm -hmm. And what I found, I would call You know, La Rose and Zenusha, and it is the same call and response, mm -hmm. the same um, La Vie, you called it, the, and it was in Creole. Yep. So I was trying to think what is the connection, and I think probably our rural, the rural nature of La Rose um, maybe just got stuck there and it didn't evolve into the Calypso. But there is, I mean, you would not know the difference between those of 1919. Mm -hmm. and so, so that was one point. The other point was the economic history and how it has um, disconnected the role of the Atlantic slave trade or the South or the Caribbean. Um, you mentioned cotton. And true. One of the comments I remember, I'm not sure who said it, that the slaves were the technology of the first industrial revolution. Because this is only the only way that could have taken place. Um, and, and so I thought that a very interesting that we do not teach our part, our critical part in the history. It has been downplayed. And the last one, um, I think that everything, if culture, carnival, calypso, evolves. And even the carnival and the roots, um, sometimes the decisions for the roots is because of the technology change. We've moved from when a big band in St. Lucia was 200 people to now where it's close to 1,000 people. When the, truck was, when the music truck was in the back of a van, now it's in a 40-foot container, and it cannot maneuver <laughs> around town. So you then have to adjust. And so it's not necessarily taking it out of the urban areas, but it's dealing with the growth and the expansion. But all in all, I think um, you've given us a lot of food for thought, some things to reflect on, and I want to thank you and continue doing the good work. And um, just try to help us keep pace or not stay so far back with our tertiary institution, <laughs> in the, with the dynamics that we're trying to achieve in the new world. Thank you very much. Yeah. Th thank you. Those are three hard um, questions or issues. Let me, let me take the last one. Um, uh, yes, the, the, technologies, the technologies change, um, and the, the arena for the display of the art forms also changes. So you're right, the growth of the music truck, or what Marshall Montano calls the big truck, um, with big song systems that can, in effect, broadcast the music um, for miles, even. Um, some of the biggest bands in Trinidad and Tobago um, topped 15,000 members in a band. Um, they had 50 trucks, not just music trucks, they have toilet trucks, they have trucks where to cool down, they have trucks for drinks, they have trucks for, you, for the masqueraders to, to rest, um, to put on their makeup, um, very customer centric. In fact, I would argue the most customer centric industry in the Caribbean is in the carnival masquerade area. Uh, I mean, and it's funny because one, one time I had to go collect a costume for a friend of mine who's coming in from the Bahamas. Um, so I go to the counter to collect the costume and they give me a pizza box. So I'm standing there at the counter um, and it was a nice packaging. So it's not just a pizza box. It's, like a, actually, it's more like a, a box you would get from a department store, Harrods or something, to be quite precise. Um, so I'm standing there at the counter waiting, and so the woman finally says to me, why are you here still? And I said, but is, have I received everything? Is this all? She goes, yes. 
<laughs> now, I, my, my tradition of masquerading, you know, you had to have boxes. <laughs> it would take up half the car. All right? Um, so the, 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 the art forms move and, 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 and transform. And so um, the, 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 the music technology now allows even for a performer to be on one truck and to be broadcasting through multiple trucks and music systems. So because the cost of having a musical performer live has become so exorbitant um, that it means then that they have to use the technology to cut down on those costs. So a whole range of things are happening. The, I think um, the, your other point, I think that there's a critical role, for example, of chambers of commerce, and I know you are representing the Chamber of Commerce here in St. Lucia, um, and you're an avid carnivalist as well. I don't want to give all of your business out, but um, so I can see where you're coming from. I think there's a role for us to ensure that more of the firms and, in, um, uh, and players and stakeholders who are engaged in these new areas of our economy, well, in fact, they're not so new. It's just that they've become, they've mo they're moving from the margins more to the center. That we create avenues by which they can um, become better embedded in advocacy and, and lobbying for improved services which includes a whole range of things so that, um, um, so that we create mechanisms by which um, the art forms are better elevated. So last time I was in Barranquilla and in Colombia, I gave a presentation at the Carnival um, Museum. Uh, and, um, and they actually had um, at the university all of these huge murals hanging from the trees on the campus by Leandro Soto from um, Cuba. And I mean, I, I have one of his paintings in my home in, in, in Barbados, so I immediately knew his work. So I was like, wow, Leandro is here. <laughs> All right. So there's a way in which um, um, there's a critical role for our academic institutions to, to play in promoting um, and legitimizing, further legitimizing these art forms and their role in our societies. And so I think partnership with the private sector is a really important component of that, along with working with the public sector to elevate these issues. I don't know if I've answered all of your questions or comments, but, um, but I'm sure we could pick up. Uh, okay, we've come I think we have one more question from the audience, sir. Just one more, no, or can we entertain any more? At this no. time, yes or no? We've come to the two-hour mark. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, so we are at the two-hour mark now, and um, we know time is very important here. We've, we have Ambassador Jacinth Henry Martin, who's the coordinator of the coordinating office for the offices and units of the General Secretariat in member states, who will now give the closing remarks. Thank you very much. It is quite regrettable that such an interesting discussion is going to close in this way, but we're very appreciative for what transpired before we lost uh, audio and now video. In the interest of time, I am pleased to recognize esteemed colleagues, guests, everyone in the virtual and physical spaces through adoption of the earlier established protocol, and to thank you all for your presence. The honor falls to me to thank Dr. Nurse. Firstly, for making the time to be your presenter today. As Dr. Nurse, you delved into the topic Carnival and Black Atlantic Festival, social movements, and diasporas. This activity, seemingly we're getting video again. This activity is an extension of the fifth Inter-American Week for people of African descent in the Americas highlighted annually by the OS during the month of March. As people of African descent, having struggled, survived, and surpassed imposed limitations as we have, every day is a proper reason to celebrate our victories and our contributions to science, 
culture, economic development, and yes, to music, tradition, folklore, and the outpouring of artistry, explosive color, and energy that is carnival. Just as the seas moved us from shore to shore, so too has migration taken with us in our veins, in our hearts, in our artistic sinews, the inspiration that colors communities, carnivals, festivals, families, and social movements the world over, enriching lives, sustaining livelihoods, and contributing in myriad ways to economic growth. Thank you, Dr. Nurse, for reminding us of the critical value of artistic expression in support of our economies and in sustaining traditional and non-traditional avenues for entertainment, employment, entrepreneurship and innovation, creative industries, social commentary and activism, street theater. I'd like to highlight the work now of the OS National Office in St. Lucia and its steady outreach and participation on the national landscape. And to commend OS representative Lily Ching Soto and her team for this remarkable collaboration with the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. The OS is mindful that in any institution in which young fertile minds are being molded, there exists an opportunity not only to promote the work of the organization, but to speak specifically to offerings that can have a lifelong impact on overall development. I speak especially about OS scholarships, internships, the model OS program, the Young America's Business Trust, YABT, long and short-term courses for teachers, among others. I encourage you to inquire with the OS office and to familiarize yourself with the tremendous contribution which the organization is making to the development of citizens of St. Lucia and across the Americas. Dr. Nurse, I have noted your, in inverted commas, demand for a Carnival Museum of the Americas. And if I may, I would suggest that you work perhaps by presenting a paper to start with, with the Art Museum of the Americas, which is part and parcel of what the OS offers to the hemisphere and which is already a repository of many of the most interesting works from top artists of yesteryear and current and we hope for many years in the future. So maybe there is scope here for another collaboration with the Organization of American States. In closing, I remind you not to miss the opportunity to witness for yourself the two-day art competition and exhibition, which will be launched on May 26, in commemoration of the fifth Inter-American Week for People of African Descent in the Americas, another thrilling collaboration between the OS National Office and the Sir Arthur Lewis College. Exciting prizes have been committed by our sponsors, who I recognize and thank for their corporate spirit and generosity. M and C, Lefort Restaurant, The Body Holiday and Bay Gardens Hotels, Forever Charmed, The Coffee Shop, The Landings Hotel, JFC, and Oasis Restaurant. For its part, the OS continues to expand its role and relevance across the hemisphere to ensure that citizens of the Americas are provided opportunities to live in secure democratic societies in which their human rights are respected and in which they are afforded avenues for socioeconomic advancement through education, culture and the arts, and other catalysts for sustainable development. Our combined efforts will continue to tackle impediments to the realization of these imperatives and to create bridges to success for the people of the broader hemisphere covering the membership of the OS, including our CARICOM member states. As coordinator of the national offices, I underscore the integral support of the OS national offices in this regard and reiterate their role in delivering on the work of the organization 
in the member states. Thank you one and all. I join with the OS rep Lily Ching and with all of the other representatives of the OS in the hemisphere in wishing you a wonderful and productive afternoon. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think we've come to the end of our proceedings this evening. I think we've come to, can you hear me? Okay, I think we've come to the end of our proceedings this evening. Very riveting conversation, very interesting topic. Um, that will give us food for thought for a very long time, con considering that Carnival is coming um, in, a, in just a few months, it is? Yeah, in a few months. Okay, thanks for coming, everyone, giving us your time and participating in this conversation. Thanks, Dr. Nance.